than 70% of contact with our customers are solution providers. So we are there for them. Okay. We want to help them, we want to empower them to do business and to uh, to go with us. That's why they like us, because we are very transparent. And I would say one of the pillars of contact IO around, um, around expertise um, that actually is uh, coming up live next week. Uh, it's called Proximity Studio, right? And the cost of switching that there are, they are and they're increasing with your infrastructure. The question is, are you with the right party? Sure. No, because everybody hates the installation part. Because everybody is treating it like the, like the ugly kid, you know? Nobody wants to go out with them. Okay, welcome back to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Beaker System. My name is Steve Statler from Statler Consulting and we're doing this in partnership with our friends at, at, at Proxbook. Uh, before we launch into uh, this week's interview, I just want to do a shout out for our podcast version of the show. So uh, if you prefer to listen rather than to watch, then head, head over to iTunes or whatever your favorite uh, podcast app is and search for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Beaker System and you can listen to us whilst you're jogging or in the bath or whatever you want to do. You don't have to sit in front of a computer to, to, to watch us. But uh, glad that you are watching us uh, or listening to us. Uh, and this week we are communicating with Poland. So one of the biggest players in Beaker system is Contact.io. Uh, and I am really uh, pleased to be talking to the CEO of Contact, uh, Shimon Nim Nimchura. Almost got through your name. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for joining us. Welcome, Steve. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure. And, uh, you know, we're recording this uh, just gone 10 o'clock uh, Pacific time. What is it? What's the time for you over in Poland? So right now it's, uh, it's actually uh, 7 p.m. Okay. So well, I'm already at my home. I appreciate it. I'm in my home and they're doing building work, so we may uh, hear that a little bit in the interview. Um, but let's uh, kick off with the kind of the traditional uh, brief elevator introduction to your to your company. It'd be great to hear your how you introduce uh, Contact IO uh, when when people uh, are not familiar with what you do. Yeah. So so Contact IO is w one of the leaders in beacon space, uh, especially from the uh, from the from the level of hardware. That we're uh, that we're producing, uh, but our mission is to uh, to lead the market uh, by empowering our customers, by empowering businesses uh, with beacon infrastructure and also with expertise, so they can focus on their core business. They don't have to rethink the wheel. Uh, they can have a partner they can rely on in terms of beacon infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean hardware, software, uh, services, and lastly, the expertise. Very good. And I noted that emphasis on expertise because one of the big questions I always have when I try and uh, find out about companies is, you know, what's the game plan? How do you make money? And I think one of the things that's actually been really appealing about what your company does is it's a pure play company. Uh, you are, seem, to, seem to be very focused on the beacon hardware. And my observation from the outside is you've done really well with partners because you are not making noises about building layers of software that might compete with your partners. Yes. So whenever I talk to people in the Beaker system, your company is one of the first ones they mention. And I think it's probably because you have a good product, but also because you're partner friendly. So that's a long rambling question, but, the, but really I, I know that you talked about expertise and I, I'm thinking that wasn't just a accidental thing. Is that an area where you're looking to do monetize to, to monetize to generate revenue from your expertise. Okay, so uh, as answering your question twofold. First, yes, um, we are very partner friendly, but this is uh, to the fact that we are very horizontal. So we don't want to go. We don't want to go vertical. We don't want to go to the sort of a use case software uh, because this is this is where our customers are. Seventy more than seventy percent of contact with our customers are solution providers. So we are there for them. Okay. We want to help them, we want to empower them to do business and to, uh, to go with us. That's why they like us, because we are very transparent and we're a partner in their, in their business. On the other end, the expertise part, 
right, is where we actually uh, are on top of a lot of use cases, a lot of uh, solutions, and we know who is doing best stuff. So partner friendly, um, uh, and, and just go a little bit more into where you see the future in terms of revenue. I can't let that, that, that piece go. Yeah, from, from the from the expertise part, yeah. uh, we, we truly believe that uh, you know contact IO being on top of uh, a lot of different uh, use cases, a lot of different solutions that are that are being there. Uh, we can help our customers to choose the right solution, to choose the right methodology and the right partners to go with hand to hand. So that's where the expertise comes in. Uh, this year we'll introduce, uh, I would say, one of the pillars of contact IO around, um, around expertise um, that actually is uh, coming up live next week. Uh, it's called Proximity Studio, uh, which, is, uh, which is both offline and online uh, way of connecting you know, businesses with the expertise and with the final customer. So um, that should be that should be our answer to, to to the expertise element. So proximity studio that sort of sounds like a IDE a integrated development environment, but it's uh, is this sort of similar to a a prox book where you're um, kind of providing access to consultants, or, or would your staff be providing the consulting? So this is so it, it's a, it it may like might sound similar, but this is more about showcasing the, the real software. Uh, you know, for example, getting to the physical place and seeing a demo of something working. And then on top of this, there's the expertise, there's the sort of a, a easy way to choose the right provider, the right software. Um, so that's the offline part. And the online element, it's about uh, making sure that we can uh, capture the value of uh, for example, enterprises were interested, um, and and tell them um, what is that is being done, what is that that works. Uh, educate the market technically. So um, I would say similar to Proxbook, but on a totally totally different angle. Okay. Uh, so if we just spend a little bit more time on that. Um, how do you deploy services? So it sounds like you're selling, you, you will be selling services and you've got a lot of expertise. You do a great job in, with your webinars and capturing information and sharing it already. But this is much more kind of customer specific advice rather than kind of a general education piece, which you've already been doing quite well for some time. Um, how do you do that across so many different geographies? Because, and, and maybe we should go back and level set, what geographies do you sell to at the moment? All right, so, so Contact.io is pretty global right now, but uh, definitely we are very strong in Europe and, and also in America. Uh, then around 20% of our sales is APAC region. Uh, so based on that, we're also building up our offices. So a strong office here in Krakow, but also business office in Berlin, then uh, office in Guadalajara, Mexico, uh, that supports our New York office. And last but not least, the Shenzhen office supporting the APAC region. So out of that, we want to make sure that through the proximity studio, uh, we can drive the value both ends. So deliver quality uh, business partners to our solution providers, to our partners who are using our technology to build their solutions, and also to the uh, people on the other end who are looking for quality service, who are looking for quality use case software. Uh, so we want to connect them. So mm, I would say different than 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 a prox book uh, from the perspective of the value delivery, actually. Uh, but it does sound like it's in a way a solutions directory. Is that a, a fair? Is that one aspect of what you're doing? You're providing a solutions directory. Um, yes, but this is on a very boutique level. So uh, mostly targeting here, uh, I would say medium uh, to large enterprises and also hand-picked partners who deliver quality software okay. uh, that are our customers. Okay. So um, this is not a directory that is being created and, and pulled all the contact your customers into this, but this is a directory of really successful, uh, really successful players and providers out there who know what they're doing and have verified their, their their business, verified their software, and we want to empower this uh, because we believe this is a really good way of driving the future of, of, of beacons, 
uh, by actually uh, connecting the right people together on the level of actual, uh, I would say, business impact. Well, it's fascinating that you're doing that. And I, and I do think in the industry it's overdue uh, because really what you're providing with your beacon infrastructure, and we'll get back to the product and talk about the hardware and all that sort of thing and also how the company was founded. But I'm just really interested by this thing that you're doing because it seems to me that what you're doing is you're providing a development platform. Um, you, have, uh, you have some standard APIs, but there's some, and, and maybe you'll argue with that and, and feel free to, if you don't agree with that, to what degree, when someone's choosing Contact.io or one of your competitors, to what degree are they committing to a platform and to what degree can they just swap out what you guys do with, with something else? That's a really good question and, and we're constantly answering this, constantly looking for, for, the, for new answers to that question. Uh, as for now, Contact.io is all about this very horizontal approach that our customers really enjoy and know that they have a f you know, freedom over the hardware and also on the software. So, so they, can, they can use the software stack but they don't have to. It's the it's sort of this this is this is given uh, in the package and we don't force this we don't do this uh, as as others that is required to use the software or you have to pay for the software to uh, to use the platform here we want to be uh, supportive to our customers to the extent that we are trying to build only the the solutions only the elements of the software that they find valuable uh, so they don't have to rethink the wheel. Um, and yeah, it interconnects, you know, the hardware has to be smart, has to have uh, cloud to, to for basic management, for security, for all that stuff. Uh, but then also there are new services that, that we'll be introducing that will be more about uh, processing power, uh, that it will be about data, that we can help our customers to not, you know, to focus on their core, not really think the wheel, do not, uh, do not worry about the servers. And, and these these elements that they don't that that don't bring value to their to their final use case. Right. So if I can summarize, I think you're offering people that are building solutions, whether they are software partners, services partners, or they're a venue, they can use the generic iBeacon APIs, and basically that gives them the ability to switch switch out one product for the other. But we all know that there are big gaps in in the basic offerings that are provided at the OS level and so yeah. you know my my hypothesis is if you're going to build a solution then one of the places where you can get that missing middleware is from the beacon supplier and if you do that then you're making a commitment you're, you're basically saying this is a platform and I'm going to build on it and then I'm sort of throwing my lot in with whoever that platform provider is and um, that's just kind of the way it is unless you want to write everything yourself which no one can do. Yeah. Uh, and so, if you're this is, doing, this is very valid, yeah. yeah, if you're doing that, this is very valid. Yeah. You can see, like you know, uh, for example, Google uh, building up the platform. So you can always choose to to go with Google and 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 use uh, Edistone and EID to uh, to handle all your beacon infrastructure. The only problem is this is not ideal with iBeacon again. So uh, you need to have those both standards handled. So, so ideally, a platform like Contact.io is providing you a sort of a, a solution where you have both mm -hmm. iBeacon and Edistone provided with security, provided with everything you need to have your infrastructure being run easily. But on the other hand, yes, of course, this is like choosing your server provider, like AWS versus Microsoft versus whatever else. You are committing, right? And the cost of switching that there are, they are and they are increasing with your infrastructure. The question is, are you with the right party? Are you with AWS or any sort of other business of that scale growing into the, to the level that is decreasing the total costs of ownership for you? So it makes your business uh, grow easier, right? So, um, Absolutely. yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is the decision that, that all businesses have to do. And this is like not only the software platform, but also the hardware, but also the support and the services that you can get uh, so we're back here to the basic relationship in business. This is not just another business that you can scale up online. This is a business where you have to build a relationship with the customer. And this is like when you need the real regular sales, when you need to build this, this relationship and, and, and carry it on. 
All right, yeah, so this is not just a commodity. It's not something that I would buy uh, purely on the technical aspects of the product, although the, those have to be satisfied. I'm deciding on a platform, so I need to decide, is this platform provider going to be around? Does their business complement or conflict with mine? And also, what are the solutions that are available on this platform? You know, why did Windows win uh, to the extent that it, it did win, which I think it did, uh, it's because there's a huge amount of software available. And so it just has amazed me that very few, if any, I don't know any uh, of the Beacon providers have said, here's our solution portfolio. Here is, here are all, here's all the software, here's all the analytics, here's all the integrators. Uh, and we've seen partner announcements, but I think you will be one of the first that really goes to market with, with a directory of, of, of solution providers that you've curated. So I think that's, that's a significant commentary on the maturity of the market and your strategy. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's also about the quality our customers get. Uh, customers on both ends, right? So, so the customers who are the solution providers and customers who want the solutions. So we want to make sure they get the best thing. So then again, that's why I don't like the name of directory, more like this expertise where we are choosing the, the, the ideal uh, the ideal outfit for for the customer. Um, so um, so yeah, it's it's more of a, again business relationship building stuff than than a di directory actually. And so you announced recently that you are going to be helping your customers with deployment. Um, so that is less about recommending someone that is qualified, or or is it? So how do you intend to do the delivery of those uh, deployment services. Is it going to so, be your so staff or your partners? So this is going to be our staff because okay. our, even our partners, they, they have this pain point. So most of our customers, they want to have this problem solved. And and we've been, we've been listening to this and we said, okay, we have to try uh, to, to tackle this problem. And we're building, uh, we're building uh, four, four teams across the planet, uh, scalable teams. That can that can execute on on any sort of a beacon deployment and maintenance program. Uh, of course, this is limited through the sort of a scale, but for the, with the biggest biggest projects that we're doing with our customers, uh, we're helping them with the installation, and, and they love it because they can they can mitigate the whole operations and, and risk, and and even the even the sort of uh, um, you know paycheck uh, on the on the on the accounting side that doesn't ruin your PNL. Uh, out to contact IO, which is a significant, uh, often a significant partner in terms of revenue. So we're not that uh, we're not that you know reluctant to to put people on payroll. So um, so that's 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 why we're helping them to achieve success, so they can focus on their core, on their final sort of uh, use case software and delivery on that to customer, while we do everything else on the infrastructure. So it sounds like your headcount's going to be growing. I mean, it, you've already gone up. Last time I looked, it was like 80 people from uh, a handful to 80 people. So it sounds like you're going to be growing even more. Yeah, so well, last time I checked, I mean, today it's 87, which is pretty shocked to me because last week it was 83, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's pretty high. But uh, so again, this, these, uh, this setup for, for, for installation services will be very flexible. So it means that it will be key team leaders and then everything else will be flexible. Okay. So it doesn't mean that there will be a lot of a lot of people on the payroll. Right. So there's not uh, a lot of people driving things. vans and trucks. It's going to be the, the the people who have the organizational expertise, and then you'll probably contract in and pull in the other stuff. What, exactly, exactly. What geographies? Like and, and then we will be looking for economies of scale in that process. Uh, ideally, trying to find the sweet spot where we can make it more out, so, sort of semi-automated process. Well, that makes sense. If I'm a venue or a retailer, then I, I don't need to build a team that can do this one-off or very occasional process of deploying the hardware. So, uh, whereas you can, uh, you can smooth it out. And even if I'm an integrator, so I, I mean, one of the obvious questions is, how do your integrator partners feel about this? Because you're sort of, are you not getting into their space a little bit? So, um Actually, no, because everybody hates the installation part. Because everybody is treating it like like the ugly kid, you know. Nobody wants to go out with them. And 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 the truth is that they all love someone who's going to do it A to Z, and they don't have to touch it. So even the integrators, 
They're all about uh, they're all about you know making sure the software works here and there, integrates with the existing legacy software that uh, the customer has, and then all they want to hear is, hey, here's the invoice for the installation. Thank you. Bye bye. So. Um, they don't want to mess up because th there is a lot of risk. There is a lot of risk that with the company you're going to subcontract, uh, with people screwing it up, with people have no, not no, not having expertise, not having the right mobile app to, for example, pinpoint the beacons in the map. So there's like there is a tons of problems that we have identified uh, for our customers and and the and, and the installation process. Uh, to fix, so uh, we believe that uh, this is uh, this is this is going to be uh, something something successful. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a great area. It's a critical success factor for any deployment. You uh, you yeah. put the beacons in the wrong place, and it's very expensive to fix that, and it can just ruin the uh, impact of the software. So I can see why people would want you to do it. I grew up in England and uh, north of England in Yorkshire. There's an expression. I won't try and do the Yorkshire accent, but the expression is where there's muck. There's brass. Where, where, where it's dirty, there's money. Um, and I think uh, it's a dirty area, but it's also a highly skilled area. So I think that is a great decision on your part. Yeah, it's also an area of, when, when you look at the infrastructure costs, it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty thick line. Because these, these are the costs of logistics, of, of pulling it out. If, 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 if one can make it scalable globally, then it's a, it's a pretty big revenue chunk. Yeah, and you can probably do it more. This is a name for everything else. So. so, is it fair to say that the cost of the beacon hardware is actually less than the cost of the deployment? Is that that's that's what I hear people oh, say? That's, that's definitely that's definitely true. Of course, it is. Sometimes it's uh, it's uh, three or five or, or sixfold. So, if you actually get really good at this, which I think you are probably well placed to do, then you can offer efficiencies and economies just because you're really good at doing it. So it's it's about finding out the scale, and and and, and if if you find that scale, if you if you can determine that economy, and and for example, uh, semi-automate the process. This is this is this is something that that will that will be meaningful. Very good. And so, what geog what are the four geographies that you're starting off doing this in? So so obviously the, the first one is uh, states. Um, so America, but also we are. We're right now um, aiming to roll out in Mexico, so we're going to do one of the first deployments there. Obviously, Europe, operated out of Poland and Berlin, uh, and uh, lastly, the APAC region, uh, out of Shenzhen, um, where we'll be looking into deployments in China, mainland, but also in, uh, in the surrounding uh, Asian countries. It's just a huge potential for growth, isn't there? You kind of uh, you're starting off in some great locations, but it's clear that there's going to be a lot of uh, potential to go beyond that. Well, let's um, let's uh, change tack here and go back to the beginning. And I'd love to hear how the, the founding story. Uh, I think I've heard bits of it, but I personally have a, a passion for using beacons for good. And you, you've actually. Um, uh, co-opted that phrase and say so you have a program for Beacons for Good and tell me about Beacons for Good and then uh, before that tell me how you founded the company. Yeah, this is pretty aligned with, with sort of the, the beginning. So I was, I was at a bank and uh, I was talking with my, with my business, uh, business bank here and, um, and he, was, he was just doing the regular stuff with, with the account for us and then he asked what we're doing and I explained him that we're, we're we're a tech company. Uh, I was in the in a, in a previous company back then, and he asked me if I could uh, if I could advise him uh, like 15 minutes of my time on his project. So I said, yeah, of course, no problem. And he visited me in the office, and he said, oh, of course, he visited me uh, with his friend who is blind, and they told me that um, they've been you know testing out different museums in Europe and in the States and the solutions for visually impaired, and they haven't found anything that works. All of the all of the blind people, they get the devices they don't know, they can't see. They have the interfaces they cannot use because they don't see them. So usually you end up with a device, and then you have a person that's gonna guide you through. Uh, so it's it's ridiculous and it doesn't work. So we even so I so I was I was amazed that the with sort of this this um, this this project, it's affecting uh, roughly 300 million people on this planet who have some sort of uh, 
either are visually impaired or have uh, severe visual disabilities. And, um, and I found this very attractive. At that point, I was already departing from my previous company. So I was like, okay, this is an endeavor that, that I really like. It, there isn't much business to this, but I really like it from a social impact perspective. So uh, I decided to go on that. I invested uh, together with my partner. We invested our own money into this. Um, and uh, we found out that the only device that they know, that blind people know by heart, is their smartphone. So we have to give the, the smartphone some sort of a context, some sort of a navigation inside to deliver the audio description, to deliver navigation in the, in the object, in the, in the building. And, and how, this is how we created the very first beacon. It was just a, the, the old Bluetooth device uh, sending out the data uh, from, the, from the device. So not just broadcasting its MAC address, but also sending the data. And uh, we realized that, okay, first we have to take it to the cloud, assuming that the internet is everywhere and you have GSM. And then second thing, we have to share this because there's too many ways of using it. There's too many use cases that you, you, you can create with that. And we've been overwhelmed with that. So our, our hypothesis was uh, we can do more social impact uh, if we actually share it with the, with the world. And luckily enough, we have created the very first prototype, we tested it out, and a couple months, two months later, we had Apple releasing iBeacon. So for us, it was like a self, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. We realized, okay, we definitely want to go that way. So reverse engineered that. Uh, put it on the, on, the, on, the, on the beacon, and we opened it up for, for pre-orders, and then it blew up. We had orders from all over the globe, hundreds of orders in the very first month of operation with no marketing, absolutely no marketing, just a couple of blog posts uh, or, 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 uh, or discussions on, on the web uh, about uh, what we just launched. And, uh, and that was the start. This is, this is where we realized, okay, in the first month of operations, we're a global company. We have to now deliver. We have to now, you know, scramble and, and, and make sure that, that uh, our customers get what they want. And, and now when I look back and the hypothesis of the social impact, this is where I see, um, I would say, dozens of apps for visually impaired, dozens of apps for accessibility that are out there uh, that people use and that we support. We support uh, with our technology, but also we support them with our free hardware uh, that we are giving out to them and to their organizations. Uh, across the globe. So this is where the, the, the Beacons for Good um, emerged. I thought, okay, let's now enable enable everybody who has ideas and own accessibility to, to, to stand in a contest where they actually not only uh, get the free hardware, but they also elevate their businesses. They have to, you know, run those extra miles to show their app, to show what they're doing, and then gain some some um, some some PR, gain some some surfacing uh, on top of this. So uh, yeah, that was that was pretty successful, and and now we're continuing this and launching new ed- editions of that. But we're constantly supporting different apps and different organizations and how, uh, across the planet. Here. How much uh, uptake have you had from people who are applying for beacons? For good grants to because i think it's 100 beacons that you offer uh, people that are, are successful have you had much interest because it seems like it's a probably a very specialized niche market so i'm not thinking you've had very large numbers or, or maybe i'm wrong so it depends uh, some of the projects are are there, there is a couple of projects which are very large at scale some of the one of them is actually blind square which is an app that is developing across the planet uh, it has an open startup center for beacons. We're supporting it heavily and helping them, and, and the beacons goes goes into hundreds. But on the other hand, you have uh, those you know um, small projects like a university solution, uh, which all they need is 50 or 100 beacons, and they're all happy. And this is this is great. Uh, it's, it's all that much that you need to to make a local society happy and, 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 and enable them with navigation and context uh, whenever, when, when it's important. Uh, and on the other hand, you have, I would say, a larger projects as well that are about the infrastructure. So for example, putting beacons inside of uh, bus stops, uh, buses, uh, and making uh, use of this not only from business perspective, but also in the perspective for, of accessibility, which we are supporting as well. Uh, so I think, uh, 
Last week, I, I, we shipped uh, around 200 beacons to Australia to support a local community uh, on a project like this, where they, they beaconize uh, a part of town just to just to test out this with the with the local not local but country uh, association for for visually impaired. So this is this is definitely growing and definitely going into somewhere. That's really encouraging, and I think it makes so much sense. A because we want to feel good about the work we do. So I'm sure it's motivational for your staff to be part of a company that has a culture that has this aspect. Um, but I actually think there's a hard nosed commercial justification for do, doing this. And I, I've put this to some of my clients who I've been encouraging to get into this space um, because I think, you know, beacon projects are hard and the ROI is not going to happen overnight. But I think people, if people can help 50 blind people navigate through their venue. They can declare victory, put a press release out there, and that hopefully gives them the political currency to then see the project through and get to a point where they can make money from that infrastructure. Because infrastructure is, it is really challenging to, to, to prove the value of it. And so doing some good and genuinely helping people and being able to get some uh, social currency from that should be part yeah. of anyone's business plan. So just just uh, don't think about it in terms of doing good, just help people claim the PR benefits and that can be part of your survival strategy so that you can also show an ROI for your organization. And I don't know whether you think that's cynical or, but I feel like... No, that's, that. that's, that's, that's what I feel at the, at the bottom of my heart as well. This is, this is how it should be. I mean, the beauty about beacons is that they're not, they're not running out if you're using them you, you yeah. can just multiply and, and you can just share the infrastructure securely, for example, through contact IO Secure, that, that anybody else, I mean, or designated apps can use it, uh, apps for, for example, blind people, uh, at no cost, at security that, 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 that your infrastructure is not being uh, used uh, maliciously. So um, so this, is, this can be done. We're encouraging our, our, our customers to do so. Uh, later on, of course, as the infrastructure matures, there's more infrastructure on the planet, we'll be encouraging them to donate their sort of access to the network for those visually impaired apps, of course, securely and uh, fully with the uh, with, with abilities to monitor that. Uh, but the thing is that you can do good and it doesn't cost a penny. That is so, a great point. I love the point you made about you don't you don't run out of packets from these beacons. It's like, oh, sorry, yeah. all the, the blind people used up the all the, all the packets, we don't have any left. Uh, so um, that is wonderful. And just to kind of bring out this point that is implicit in what you said is when you control access to the beacons, then you have the ability to say, oh, I'm going to give free access to Blind Square, but I'm going to charge Pepsi for access to these beacons because they're making a lot of money. So if so, so that's the wonderful thing about what we call conditional access as part of a beacon network. Um, and we're, we're going to get back to that, I think, in, in a little bit. But I'm interested in just hearing a little bit more about Poland and what business is like in, in your part of the world these days. Um, I had some experience with working with some really creative people in Poland. And it seems like you've got a great education system, so you've got amazing human capital. But... Um, let's kind of stray into an area of controversy. What is your view of Brexit? What is your view? Do you think that there's any... I'm just interested in what you think about what the British people have done and why they did it. And uh, I am just, to be honest, deeply yeah, depressed uh, about what's happened there. But, uh, <laughs> definitely looks uh, different from, from a European perspective uh, yeah. than from where you're sitting. But to be honest, I mean, of course, we can assume this that, that Brexit will happen. Uh, yeah. I, I believe it will not happen. Because and this is Britain leaving the European community for anyone that's been uh, uh, locked up in uh, and uh, not reading newspapers. But yeah, yeah, I, I don't think a lot will happen because the, the next the next person who's going to take over the task of actually doing the Brexit. Uh, that's going to be difficult because he will be facing actually a failure uh, right away because if he does the break Brexit, he will face the, the economy downturn. So very difficult situation for the, for the new person. I think the new person will be all about, hey, let's not do that. 
because it's crazy. Um, from the other side, what does it mean for us? Um, I don't believe much because it only means a lot for, 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 for Britain. Um, they will definitely feel that. Uh, it, I think it's more about their sort of uh, right now current social state than actually business state. It's not a business decision that they make, I think. Uh, this is what we see in media. Uh, and this is what we see on the streets, actually, uh, which is not nice. Uh, I would say for, for Contact Bio, it doesn't mean a lot. It means maybe there will be more uh, talented people coming out in di- our direction, back to Krakow, back to Berlin, mm-hmm. uh, where they can, uh, where we can use their expertise, use their use their skills, and and, 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 and take them on board. Um, in terms of doing business with Britain, I don't think that would make any difference because in the short term, you can t- tune down the business, you can set up the policies, but in the long term, if you do so, you, the, 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 you know, the effects of that will be, will be um, terrible. So I think long term, business always wins. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, so what are the advantages and the disadvantages of running a business that's headquartered in Krakow, Poland, as opposed to um, San Jose, uh, California. Well, I guess uh, the weather is is better in <laughs> California for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and and other than that, uh, it's really hard to to get a Tesla around here. <laughs> and Uber. But uh, no, seriously, uh, it's um, it's I would say talentful engineers, the tech people you can have here. Uh, it's a, it's a really good quality. It's a, it's a really open-minded people uh, who who, um, who who are right now opening up opening up for the for the world for Europe for 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 the entire planet, and um, and this is where I believe the true strength strength of Poland is. Also, this um, sort of you can see this across Europe. You know, entrepreneurs are becoming more brave. Uh, they they are more uh, they have more guts and, and they're uh, they're just not afraid of, of starting things up where 10, 10 years ago it wasn't that uh, wasn't that pretty so it's like when you mix up the entrepreneurship with the right soil for talent uh, this is where it blows up and and, and, and I love it so um, I would say yeah tech talent especially here in Poland then you have to mix it up with business skills um, either here or or in places like Berlin. And, and then, then, then it, it takes off. So it sounds like entrepreneurship is on the rise and you've always had a great, well, as long as I've been aware, had a great education system. You've got no shortage of smart people. What, what is the typical weighted cost for an engineer in, uh, in Krakow, Poland? Because um, we know, I, I mean, I, I probably can't say the numbers from my old company, but I know that it's just amazingly expensive. People are so expensive. Um, in California, especially. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so in Krakow and Poland in general, because it's pretty pretty similar, uh, we can we can look at five to eight thousand uh, dollars a month gross uh, gross costs of, of, of having a, an employee, a technical engineer on board. Um, so of course, from the I would say regular salaries, average salary in the in the, in the market. Uh, of, of any jobs, uh, it's it's pretty high. It's like two or three times big, big higher than, than their average salary on, on, on any other job. But uh, but from a point point of view of, of Europe, uh, so Western Europe and also of course the States, this is this is this is much less than than, yeah. than there. It's incredible. And and so and what about healthcare infrastructure and that sort of thing? Is there universal healthcare, or do you have to pay for the healthcare for your so there's a there's a pretty good public health care. Mm-hmm. Um, it's getting better and better. Of course, it's like I don't I don't know a place on earth people don't uh, uh, people are super happy about their system, but it's pretty okay I would say. And then of course you have this whole private uh, private infrastructure that you can use that uh, and you know companies like Contact IO we all provide that uh, access to free medical private medical care. But you have uh, all the specialists within one day. Uh, you have, um, you know, dentists and everything. Everything you can think of accessible on, on, a, on, a, on a pretty, uh, pretty good quality level. So universal healthcare doesn't necessarily mean you're preventing people uh, getting the kind of the faster access in the private healthcare. Which in this country, when the, when the right wing people were trying to persuade us that. 
Uh, we were better off with having lots of uninsured people that, uh, that if we went the other way, then we didn't have to give, a, give away uh, the opportunity to have the extra coverage. But I'm getting too political. Let me get back to business um, and talk about contract manufacturing. So I was kind of looking at your staff and the 80 people. I love the fact that you've got pretty much everyone's photograph on the website. And uh, um, so I, you change the names of what people do. Uh, so it's a little bit. So I'm assuming you have a lot of people with the title growth. And I'm assuming that means sales. Is that right? Uh, is growth no, actually, sales actually, no, the growth is about something else. So the sales team is the team that executes on, on the selling strategy and, and, and the relationship building with customers. The growth theme is about, um, of course, many different things, but uh, I would say in general, it's about finding out the future revenue, okay. uh, so analyzing different opportunities in the market, on the product, on the on sort of, you know, com competitor outlook, um, and also like, making sure that we understand every single dollar that comes into contact IO, what kind of uh, values behind it, what kind of sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, values the customers are paying for uh, are there in that dollar, uh, what is the sort of a trend, what is the anything that attaches to it. Yeah, it sounds like so, a mixture of strategy and business development functions maybe. But as well, yes. So that was a very long way of me saying you don't have like 40 manufacturing people. So it seems like you you use partners to actually do the physical manufacturing. Is that true? So yeah, at Contact, as we as we started actually, uh, we approached the whole manufacturing world with no knowledge about it. We were like we've been learning from from nothing, and and for us uh, guys that come from software, it was like okay, uh, this is insane, right? How do we make this happen? How do we produce this? How do we make the injection molds? Why, did it, why, did, why does it take three months to create a, a tooling for that? It's, it's, it, was, it was a total, total, totally different world for us. So we approach it also on, on, from a different foot. So, so now we have the centralized ordering. Uh, we have subcontracted factories uh, delivering on tiny tasks. And that's why we're able to, to, to have not only very high uh, volume capacity, but also um, very high effects of scale on, on what we do. Uh, but to, be, um, to, uh, to, to, to shock you here, uh, the assembly, the final assembly, when the beacons are programmed, they are put into the cloud and they are given the security elements. It's all happening at our own facility. Okay. So we have just a couple of people doing this. This is a very effective process, um, but this is all in our hands uh, because every single beacon that contact IO manufactures is, uh, is is sort of a different entity, a separate entity uh, that has its you know, representation in the cloud and uh, security credentials um, and, uh, and and keys for the handshake. So it's um, it's something that it's not just a just a. It's not just a piece of hardware. It's it's already something that is uh, it's an element of the system. That's interesting. So, uh, to, at the risk of being insulting, and uh, let me yes, uh, the best way to put it is, um, our beacons a commodity. Uh, do I'm sure you one of the things that you have to do, or your sales teams have to do, is convince people that they can't just make their own beacon. Um, and I think some people feel like, oh, I, can, I get these amazing modules from the, the chip guys. And I can just do it myself. Uh, what's, yeah, of course. What's the, um, first of all, are beacons a commodity? And uh, let me just keep it. So the, definitely, definitely beacons are becoming a commodity. And it's, I believe this is great because it means that this technology is actually, you know, saturating the market and it's, it's going in the direction that it's going to be everywhere. Um, we're not there yet, of course, but then again, um, of course, a lot of people have their ideas of building their own beacons and, and doing this stuff themselves. Um, usually they end up uh, going back to us and, and, and doing this stuff with us because there's, there's this little thing about hardware. It's called scale and um, something that you just cannot overcome. It's when you, when you look at the prices of the modules and everything in there, um, at the at the beginning, you end up with uh, twenty dollar or twenty five dollar of of cogs mm -hmm. on a beacon. So it's like this is not a sustainable, and of course it drain, drags you away from doing your core business. So 
uh, scale in the hardware business is king actually. So you need to have scale and, and doing, even if you are a big solution provider for a certain region, you will not get the scale of uh, someone who is, you know, servicing all the software providers on the planet. So that's, that's where it kicks in. Uh, the hardware has to be scalable. So if I am a, uh, like a Walmart or even if I'm not a Walmart, if I'm a, I'm a, I'm a top 50 retailer, I may have the scale, but what I'm also hearing you say, you say is, well, you may actually be able to get a good price on the cost of goods if you're buying hundreds of thousands of beacons, but you still won't have a platform. You won't have the software development community around um, what you do. And of course, you will lose all the time for development and all the time for tooling. Uh, you will have a lot of risk that goes with that, right? So all in all, uh, it's like, it's like you, you decide whether you build your own servers uh, and, and server house or you go with AWS. This is that simple. So it's like, yeah, you can have your own server house, you can have your own servers and everything set up by yourself, uh, but well, this is not going to be easy and cheap, right? So are any of the really big venues, the big retailers trying to make their own beacons? I've never heard about uh, any of those doing that. Um, I, I know that, uh, for example, Facebook uh, have introduced their own beacon, which was pretty shocking for, for, for the space, I believe. Um, I, I don't know how it's doing. Uh, I haven't seen it uh, in, the, in the field. Also, the, the data on, on, on different apps, they're not showing it up. Um, so hard to tell what's the traction there. Uh, but then again, for me, uh, this is probably a waste of money. Yeah, interesting. So what's the difference? Um, so buy your beacons from someone who's in the beacon business is one of the lessons from that. What is the difference between your beacons and anybody else's beacons? If we take the community and the software stack uh, hard, if we're just kind of looking at the product level. All right, so, so what, what we know from the perspective of different uh, sort of research, different tests that have been done, is uh, one the first thing is the uh, stability of the signal. It's 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 pretty solid, and uh, competitors they have a hard time getting close to that. This is because our own proprietary design of the board, uh, lots of testing, lots of uh, sort of um, iterating on the design, on parts for the antenna, and all these elements. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is the way how we built up the firmware. So it's very stable. It's, uh, it's very flexible in terms of uh, different configurations. Um, and also, of course, something I, I believe it's, it was also a strong factor is that our design for the, re for the regular smart beacon is, is very, uh, very discreet. And this is something that our customers were looking into. They wanted a discrete beacon on the wall or whatever that people don't see. So, for example, funny story, of course, you can have them white so they, they're not visible on the, on the wall. Mm -hmm. But for one of our customers in Switzerland, they had uh, golden ceilings. So we have the beacons uh, painted gold. So uh, for, them, for the beacons to be discrete. Yeah. And wow. this, is, this is all about this technology. It has to be, it has to be in the background. You, you, you can't think about it and you shouldn't see it. That's uh, really interesting. And when, uh, when I was at Qualcomm and we shipped the first beacons to the Apple stores, then they had to all be sprayed silver because they had to blend in with, uh, uh, with that. Yeah. Um, and um, so here's one of, for people who haven't seen it, here's one of the, um, the, the, the smart beacons, I guess. Uh, although this is the original version, what's changed with the new version? Um, so this is, uh, I, I have no idea who, which version you, you're holding because they all have the same casing, but uh, <laughs> this there's is like constant, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a constant development in the firmware. So it means, um, you know, better performance on the battery, better performance in signal, uh, different uh, features for broadcasting, for example, iBeacon and Eddystone together uh, with, through the pocket interleaving. Um, of course, the new version has double the battery, so it can hold for, for at least five years on a regular configuration. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a constant development on, on both iterating the hardware and also iterating the firmware, while the form factor stays pretty much the same. 
Okay, and my, my favorite version of this that I've seen anywhere is the one with the London Underground logo on there. So I think you guys actually will ship with the customer's logo on. Is that, um, is that table stakes now? Does everyone do that or is that a differentiator? So it was definitely something that our customers wanted at some point mm -hmm. because they wanted to showcase the technology to give this to people uh, so they can touch it. So this is where the logo is important. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in some other minor cases where the logo is important to identify the tech easily, uh, like for example the underground. So someone sees that and, and knows that this is this this belongs to the underground system. Um, so it's not just something that it's, that's that has not supposed to be there. Um, but other than this, um, no, I think they actually we sold a lot of these even without any any sort of uh, logo on top because again discrete element. Well, that's an interesting point. It actually reminds me of I was on a I was moderating a panel at the Bluetooth Beacon SIG in London, and one of the guys who was a beacon provider on the panel told a story about how they actually had a whole bunch of beacons shipped into some government building and they'd been removed and detonated because people thought that they were this foreign electronic object. And so if you don't want your beacon to be <laughs> incinerated or blown up, then maybe you should put your logo on it. Um, yeah. So what, because uh, you now actually have quite a broad range of products and you were one of the first providers to offer a, a gateway, this cloud gateway product that uh, can talk to the Wi-Fi infrastructure and also monitor um, the other beacons. Is that, how prominently is that used? Is that something, are people using that technique or where does it fit in in terms of the, the product mix and um, the popularity of your different products, the cloud beacon? So for the gateway, gateway uh, product, uh, definitely this is uh, something that uh, is used in narrow use cases uh, for monitoring of beacons. But uh, there is definitely a, a main mainstream for uh, for this device to pick up uh, the beacon signal, uh, the beacons that are on things or on people, where you can enable uh, location tracking, people tracking um, use cases. So um, this is where the new generation uh, will go. That's the direction where we want to take it, uh, because we found this to be a, a big problem of our customers. How do you actually track things? How do you track people? Uh, so you need uh, both software and also the hardware to make it simple. So we're solving this with our uh, the last generation cloud beacon, the new generation, the gateway. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so we're kind of running out of time, unfortunately. I could go on for another hour, but you've got to get to bed and uh, we've got limited attention span from our audience. So let me wrap up with just a question about the number of beacons that you've shipped and uh, how many beacons have you sold so far roughly? So uh, we, we crossed the half a million uh, mark. Okay. Yeah. Congratulations, that's, that's really significant. What is Thank it you. that is driving that other than making really good beacons and being a well-run company, uh, what are the use cases that are driving that? Because I've seen, you know, the, the largest numbers I've seen in the beacon business are where people, uh, you know, like tag beacons, where you know, there's a lot of beacons being sold for tagging uh, keys that get lost. But I'm assuming your beacons aren't used for that. So this number is very significant. What what is it that is driving that volume? What applications? Yeah, so so that's a very good question. Right now, it's purely around uh, navigation, so navigating at, at at different places, but mainly airports. Um, you, you can see a lot of our, our beacons on, on airports. If you download our, our, our contact.io app, uh, then you, you, when you travel, you, you can clearly see that, that, uh, that these, uh, the, most of the airports, uh, big airports, are, are already delivered on contact.io beacons. Um, for, yeah, mostly for, for navigation, but also for some explorations around marketing communications. Um, but then, uh, then, then it's about retail element where, uh, you know, for example, Jamba Juice is delivering their campaigns together with Groupon. Um, so these kind of uh, these kind of solutions where it's about sending the right message to the right person at the right time. Um, so did you say that Jamba Juice and Groupon is using contact IO beacons, or was that just a general example? That's that's the fact. 
Yeah. yeah. All right. Congratulations. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, so these kind of retail use cases where, uh, where, where you have to meet the audience together with, uh, with, with the customer and then engage him. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, with the customer, I mean the, the retailer, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so this is so was that that's something that was definitely driving a lot of the of the revenue and a lot of the beacon sales. We see right now the whole new world of industrial uh, applications. So the industry 4.0 opening up for, for this and uh, finding beacons to be really, um, really, um, you know, usable to, to fix some of their problems around logistics, around security, around uh, tracking things and people. Very interesting. And what about uh, sports stadia and that sort of thing? I know the gimbal guys have really done an amazing job in the US, but uh, my sense is that they don't do so much business outside of the US. Are you seeing uh, use of your beacons in sports stadia or is it, or, or that less of a, an important vertical for you? Yeah, there is there is definitely interest there. And um, we we did we did some of the stuff in, in, in the U, in the United States as well. But here in Europe also, um, stadiums are a really good example of of uh, monetizing the beacon infrastructure on many levels because you can monetize uh, that with, uh, with, I would say, uh, the team mobile app. You can monetize that with other mobile apps, for example, like uh, make a brand app like McDonald's or something like that. It can be, it can be, uh, it can use the infrastructure to trigger messages and to, to drive the customers after the game, after the match to the right place. So definitely um, stadiums are really interesting, sort of out of home. Um, spots where, uh, where where beacons can can play a significant role, but I think still the biggest one that that will that will be uh, I would say obvious very soon is the the general out of home. So uh, companies like J C Deco, like Clear Channel, like Stroer, they all going to come out with beacons. They all going to come out with with stuff like that. For them, this means entering the digital world um, with their with their physical ads their physical out of home media so uh that's pretty exciting for me and i and i'm looking forward to this to happen and then how how this will evolve into a shareable infrastructure that you have to manage and and use as as a, as a medium like like any other like like you would use uh, your uh, your online space for advertising uh back in the 90s so yeah. i agree i think that's when this market really takes off i was actually just I was being interviewed before I was interviewing you. I was being interviewed by uh, David Kaplan of Geo Marketing. Um, I was promoting my book, which I guess I'm promoting now by mentioning that. Um, but my view to him was this: the future of this ecosystem is when the beacon networks take off, and you just you're basically you can when it becomes as easy as a Facebook campaign to select your beacons and uh, go for it, then then the friction will have disappeared and. Uh, uh, you can get on your jet and fly over for the next interview because because I think that's when things really will will take off. Yeah, exactly. And when you connect this with uh, with physical web, when you connect this with uh, with progressive web apps, and and sort of the direction that iOS and Android are taking into you know less apps, more uh, more stuff happening. Uh, this is where it's getting really exciting because this is finally where technology is truly enabling you to do. Uh, computing that you don't have to prompt computing that happens in the background for you to have I don't know easier life right for example well and I know I promised to wrap up so I'm gonna try and do that but I, I've got to ask you a little bit about Eddie Stone and what you're seeing in terms of traction for Eddie Stone EID um, versus proprietary methods of controlling access to beacons where do you see that going is uh, where is it today and where do you think it's going to go so, so controlling the access to beacons is, is all about, uh, well, first, securing it from piggybacking, but the other thing is making it a shareable infrastructure among different peers, right? This is purely uh, the motivation for companies like, uh, like, like Google uh, to introduce EID, the ephemeral ID, where you, where you technically secure the, the broadcast. Um, same, same thing that, that we are doing, uh, we're doing this for both iBeacon and also Eddystone where we provide the security for of the broadcast uh, for our customers. Uh, it's it's definitely something that it will be very important when the infrastructure is at scale. 
uh, something that can enable, for example, a free use of, of beacon infrastructure for, for accessibility, still not, um, not, uh, not, 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 you know, opening it up. But on the other hand, um, this is something that um, I'm, I'm looking into because you have iBeacon and you have Addystone on both ends. And um, for, for anyone who's building an app, this is a problematic thing because they have to account for both. And, um, and it's, really, uh, it's really hard to, to, to tackle this without having a company that, that, that will deliver it for you. So um, I, think, I think that we will see some sort of, uh, some sort of attack from, from Apple answering this, uh, this sort of a Google entrance uh, and Google entry to the, to the beacon space. Um, because we've seen Apple to be very uh, actually uh, positively shocked how iBeacon was uh, accepted. Because you, you've seen with every single new version of iOS, we've seen more and more uh, stuff around beacons, more in depth uh, in terms of you know um, putting this beacon into uh, deeper elements of system. So definitely, definitely Apple will show something interesting, um, and then. Uh, companies like Contact.io in means that, yeah, now we have to help our customers to make uh, to max it out to 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 use both technologies to the to the full extent. So it's Apple are not going to let Google get away with a clean sweep with EID on everything. You think there's going to be some healthy competition there? Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure there's going to be competition because purely for Google, this is a a, a big infrastructural game. Uh, where for them, you know, having the information on all the infrastructure is super valuable. It's you can compare it to AdWords and AdSense to that to that level. Um, so it's it's all about that. And and I think Apple, well, it lacks the advertising element, of course, but they know that this is uh, this is a uh, this is something of, of value. So uh, ideally, uh, then they can work together uh, with 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 ad space. To, to share that information. So yeah, I think I think Apple will definitely pick it up. All right. Well, unfortunately, we've got to wrap it up, but I really uh, thank you, Shimon, for a really interesting conversation. Great to get the chance to talk with you and uh, meet with you in person or remotely. And uh, congratulations on breaking that half million barrier with the beacons and congratulations on what you're doing with beacons for good. That's a uh, an amazing uh, venture that you have going there. And I think it's good for business as well as uh, good for people. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, thank you guys on the other end for listening to this. Um, all the best. All right. Thanks very much for, for joining us for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Beaker System. Don't forget to check us out on iTunes if you want to listen to uh, the next episodes or the past episodes. Uh, we appreciate your engagement. Share it with your friends. Questions that uh, is this is actually a homage to um, a radio BBC show called Desert Island Discs. But the question I always like to ask, and we tuck this in at the end of the show, is about a, a, a imaginary trip to Mars and um, the music that you would take. What are the three tracks that you would take on your mission to Mars if you were the Martian? And, and first of all, is this something that sounds like a nightmare to you, a trip to Mars? Or is this something that is exciting that you'd like to do? Well, it depends. Uh, it depends on how fast we travel. <laughs> yeah. How long should I stay there? Um, because it's it's about. Yeah, I'm a family guy, so uh, that that's super important for me. If the trip is with my family, then I don't care. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I can I can fly there forever. Um, yeah, I mean that that sounds exciting to some extent, but also sounds very um, very alone. Uh, yeah, so it's like we've seen it in a movie, right? Yeah. But the thing is that uh, there has to be a really great reason to go there. Right. Otherwise, no point. So. Um, well, that's interesting. Yeah, that might be exciting. Might well, be let's exciting. say um, you, you, we persuaded you to get on the on the spacecraft, and you need you have a, there's limited bandwidth to send you the music, so you just get three songs. What are the three songs that you would take? And these don't need to be American or British songs. Yeah. Maybe there's Polish songs. It's a pretty songs. good angle. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good angle. I, I would just. So there's only one in my head right now, 
and uh, this is a song that it's very ba very basic lyrics but down to down to earth and uh, it's uh, it's Able Nation um, track is called um, Kill Your Heroes. Kill Your Heroes. That's how yes, scary. It's really nice because um, it's super simple. It's about um, meeting a dying guy on a train and, um, and, and and asking him for a last advice. And the advice is never never let your fear decide your faith. So uh, it's 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 a, it's something that I truly find appealing and something that motivates me. Like when I look at my uh, sort of life and my my story, then I always find this like you just never fear, just just go and do what you think it's right, and and that's something that defines your that defines your life. And uh, yeah, very insightful. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I'm glad. Thank okay. You.